spent any time at all playing lead guitar, then there's a very high probability that you've used the pentatonic scales. Something like 99 lead guitarists out of 100 start out by learning the box-like patterns that these um, scales produce on the fretboard and invest endless hours noodling away with them. find a guitarist who can explain why these scales work so well the way they do. So that's what we're going to cover in these two guitar music theory lessons on the pentatonic scales. We'll start out by looking at the most basic way that the scales are derived. You start with a circle of fifths. Pick a note to start on as a key note. We'll pick C to show you the easiest example to start with. Then you add to that key note the next four notes as you work your way around the circle. So we've added to the note C, G, D, A and E. Then starting with the key note, we arrange these five notes in musical alphabetical order. And that gives us the notes of the major pentatonic scale in that key. In this case, the C major pentatonic scale. take the fifth note of the major pentatonic scale, in this case A, and bring it round to the start of the scale, we have the notes of the minor pentatonic scale in the relative key. So we've taken that A and taking it off the top of the scale effectively, put it on the bottom of the scale, then play the same notes from A to A, we've got the A minor pentatonic scale. Sorry. We're more used to seeing that as... note on the circle of fifths, which we normally diagram as going around the outer edge of the circle in a clockwise direction, there's an enharmonic equivalent note, that's one that sounds the same but is named differently, that we see as being on the circle of fourths. This circle of fourths is traditionally shown as moving anti-clockwise round the inside of the circle of fifths. Take a minute to refresh your memory if needed uh, by looking at this diagram and satisfying yourself that the notes in each segment of the circle sound the same as each other. and that we're moving up in fifths as we go in a clockwise direction round the outer circle, and up in fourths as we move anti-clockwise round the inner circle. Finally, notice that we use sharp symbols to name the notes on the circle of fifths, and flats to name the notes on the circle of fourths. This peculiar way of looking at these circles is pretty central to the study of music theory in general. 
other ways we might use this um, is to find the notes of pentatonic scales in some of the more awkward keys like B flat major for example. Notice how I start on the B flat, a note which can only be found in the inner circle, but as soon as I hit notes that have more complex sounding names like D double flat, A double flat and E double flat, I jump across to the equivalent notes in the outer circle which have simpler names. This process gives me the names of the notes both in the B flat major pentatonic and its relative G minor pentatonic. OK, so that's one way of deriving pentatonic scales directly from the circles of fifths and fourths. Another simple way is to work backwards from the major scale and simply remove the fourth and seventh notes of the scale. Likewise, we can see the minor pentatonic as a natural minor scale that leaves out its second and sixth notes. It's useful to notice that the actual notes left out in each relative scale are the same, in this case F and B. This is yet another aspect of relatedness. One more way of looking at the notes of the pentatonic scales that I actually find the most useful in practice is to think of them as arpeggios of five note chords. For example, if you look at the notes of the C major pentatonic scale and par them up in a certain order by taking the second note up an octave so that it becomes the ninth note, you get a jazz chord, the C six ninth chord, written as C uh, six stroke nine. Its formula is one, three, five, the major triad, followed by six to make a major sixth chord, and then the ninth note on top to make the major six nine. The six nine can make a really nice smoochy ending. Uh, to a sequence in place of a major or major seventh chord. So for example you could follow um, a sort of bog standard jazz 2-5-1 sequence D minor seventh, G seventh, C major seventh with substitutions like D minor ninth, G thirteenth, just as someone sails away into the sunset. Likewise, the relative uh, minor pentatonic scale notes can be seen to make a minor 7-11 chord. Its formula is 1 flat 3 5, that's the minor triad, followed by the flat 7th to make a minor 7th chord, and the 4th note played in the upper octave to make the 11th. There's one particular voicing of the minor 7th 11th chord which wins the prize for being the easiest chord to play on the guitar in standard tuning. Take a look at this uh, voicing of the A minor 7th 11th chord. If we voice it with the root there on A and we'll keep the 11th note in the bottom octave so we put that in as the 4th, then the flat 7th, then the flat 3rd, then the 5th, 
and then the eighth. We can simply finger it by putting our finger straight across like that. And of course, if we do that in the key of E minor, down here, it just comes across as open guitar. So in other words, the guitar is tuned to an E minor 7th, 11th chord. There's an E minor, E minor 7th, E minor 7th, 11th. You can hear the relationship. Pretty vague sounding chord, really. This also explains why blues is so easy to play in the key of E because every um, open note is part of the minor pentatonic scale, which of course is often used as a blues scale. So for example, we can just vamp away on an E or an E seventh chord, and then we can throw in. of blues let's have a look at how we turn the minor pentatonic scale into a blues scale. As you can see there is only one note difference. A blues scale can be seen as a minor pentatonic with an added flatted fifth. This gives us a rather interesting scale when we think of the way in which the notes from the blues scale uh, in A, for example, A, C, D, E, G, A, correspond to the three chords that we use um, to play a blues in A, the one, four, five chords, A, D, and E. So if we look at the notes of the, the A blues scale on this diagram, you can see that every other note here shown in red is a root note of one of the 145 chords, A, D and E. And in between these notes, the notes shown in blue, are the non-diatonic notes, the flatted third, the flatted fifth and flatted seventh. These are the notes that we actually do refer to as blue notes. So the blue scale can be seen to be made up of an even distribution of notes that provide a very strong resolve, the notes that are the root notes of the underlying uh, blues chords, and notes that provide a strong sense of tension against the uh, underlying major key chord, the A major in this case, the flat third would provide a minor sound, the flat fifth provides a diminished sound, and the flat seventh produces uh, the dominant sound. And you can clearly hear how these sounds are played off against each other in blues phrasing. So if I start by making a phrase that resolves back to the A, and then pair it with a phrase that deliberately creates tension by coming back to the flat third note, the C in this case. Resolve, unresolve. So that's using the flat third, and if I now use the um, flat fifth, oh, where's that? That's it, the uh, E flat, and we'll, we'll use the same phrase. Uh, so there's our 
resolve, there's that diminished sound. Really is a dirty, dirty sound. Sometimes called the devil's interval, that uh, A up to the flat fifth. dominant sound, that'd be our open G here, again we could perhaps come up to the root now, the octave, so there's our resolve, and there's our dominant sound. You know, each of them has a has their strength for us. By far, the strongest is the flat fifth, the diminished sound. The flat third is pretty strong, and perhaps the flat seventh. Not quite so drastic, but that's how we use the difference between the the root notes and the. Uh, the diatonic notes and the non-diatonic notes in the blues scale. So that's a quick look at the pentatonic scale from a few different angles, just to get you thinking about it uh, in, a, in a variety of different ways. In the next lesson, we'll look at how we can put this thinking to good use. So I look forward to seeing you then.